This week's feature story is the first in a new series about film movements, which Lee assures me there's more to than just play, fast forward, pause and rewind. Tonight, it's German Expressionism. I'm sitting here in the German club Tivoli because of all the Germanic buildings in Melbourne, this one is closest to my house. If you've ever been to a film lecture or sat next to a skivvy wearing wanker at the Gin Palace, you'll have heard the term German Expressionism. But what in the name of the Kaiser is it? The Expressionist movement began in Dresden in 1905. A group called Die Brücke, or The Bridge, set out to create a bridge between traditional neo-romantic German painting and modern Expressionist painting which, in terms of German endeavours of the early 20th century, is one of the more admirable ones. Along with a Munich group called the Blue Rider, these artists set about to create a style of painting based on vibrant colours, violence and high emotion. Both of these groups disbanded at the onset of World War I, and their style disappeared until around 1920. As with the Great Depression in the US, the post-war economic slump made escapist cinema incredibly popular. Filmmaking itself was funded mostly by hyperinflation. Producers would borrow money in paper mark, which would then be massively devalued by the time they had to pay it back. You gotta love film producers. But even with this cunning funding method, German films still suffered from the fact that they didn't have half the budget of Hollywood's output, which they were competing against. Keep in mind, this was back in the silent era, so with no language barrier, films from any country could be played in any other country. German films had to compete with their American counterparts, and as is always the case when there's very little money, creativity took over. Filmmakers, many of whom had begun as painters and artists, and were therefore heavily influenced by the expressionist movement from a decade earlier, used symbolism and exaggerated sets to tell their stories. The film acknowledged with popularising this movement was Robert Vine's The Cabinet of Dr Caligari in 1920. Largely credited as being the first true horror film, the movie featured wildly overstated backdrops, with objects painted onto the walls and floors and even shadows painted on. This not only allowed the filmmakers to create the film with a limited budget, but also served to create a distorted reality that reflected the main character's insanity. As with many film movements, it was their financial limitations that generated such an imaginative and inventive revolution, or evolution, in the art form. Two years later, F.W. Murnau made Nosferatu. Unable to obtain the rights to the novel Dracula, Murnau simply changed the names of most of the characters. Unfortunately, this didn't convince Bram Stoker's widow, who sued Murnau and had all known prints of the film destroyed. Thankfully, someone managed to smuggle out a copy of the movie, which, as it's now in the public domain, has been copied many times over. It was around the mid-twenties, though, that Expressionism began to lose its popularity. A new movement, not widely known these days, took its place. This movement was called New Objectivity, and was seen as an opposing reaction to the Expressionist movement. How do these styles differ? In 1925, critic Franz Rowe gave the following examples. Expressionism deals with ecstatic objects, and new objectivity deals with plain objects. Expressionism deals with the arousing, new objectivity with the engrossing. Expressionism with the summary, and new objectivity with the sustained. No, I don't know what they're talking about either. <laughs> ah, no wonder they lost two wars. But despite the growing popularity of new objectivity in German cinema, expressionism hadn't died out completely. Possibly the most famous director of the Expressionist movement, Fritz Lang, made the iconic Metropolis in 1927. Aside from Metropolis being the most influential science fiction film of all time, and if you don't agree with that it's Pistols at Dawn, it was also an incredibly political film. Set in the far off future, the film shows society has been divided into two classes. The opulent planners and thinkers above, and the toiling workers underneath. The brilliance of this film is that there's still debate today as to what its message was. Some think it's anti-capitalist, some think it's anti-communist, some think it's anti-fascist. Hitler didn't think so, in fact it was one of his favourite films. He chose to see the oppressive regime as a metaphor for the Jews, despite the fact that Fritz Lang himself was half Jewish. Arguably the last true expressionist film was also by Fritz Lang. His first foray into a sound film, M, featured Peter Lorre as a pedophile and child murderer. 
The film also pioneered the leitmotiv, or the idea that a short musical theme could represent a particular person, place, or idea. It was groundbreaking, and, and there it is. And it's still an intensely captivating thriller today. Both of Lang's films had massive budgets, which sort of went against the original impetus for the expressionist movement. By the 1930s, the Nazi party had come to power, and both the expressionist and the new objectivity movements came to an end. Many of the key expressionist directors, such as Lang, Murnau and Wein, had fled Germany before the country's next wave of films, this time propaganda, took over. But that wasn't strictly the death of the expressionist movement. Expressionist horror films such as Nosferatu, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and the 1915 film The Golem basically gave birth to cinematic gothic horror, and its influences in the work of Tim Burton, Alex Proyas, and even David Lynch. Expressionism also gave birth to film noir in the US. Not only did film noir owe a lot to the German directors of the 1920s, but many of those films were directed by them. Fritz Lang, Robert Sidemack and the Hungarian-born Michael Curtis all fled to America to escape the Nazis and ended up working primarily in the film noir genre. So there you go, a five minute crash course in one of the most important movements in cinematic history. So the next time that annoying jerk tries to impress you with his film knowledge, you can say, hey, jerk, ich bin ein knowing about German expressionism. And then you can slink away having just made a total fool of yourself. Good luck. Thank <laughs> you.